But our motivation was in part the result of too many predictions. Predictions either of this unstoppable juggernaut that was going to dominate the global economy, roll over the United States in the international order, and transform the world in some positive or negative way, um, or predictions the other way, that the wheels were going to fall off, China was going to fall apart, the system would fail, the system would collapse, the system would be transformed into, into something else. And this was justified in some ways of comparative politics theory or international relations theory. And it didn't have much of an empirical basis. We decided to approach it by asking, what are the principal challenges that China faces and that its leaders are going to have to grapple with uh, in, in the future? And as we worked on this, we realized that people matter, that the decisions that Chinese leaders make will shape what the country is going to be like and how it will act. And that it was not very fruitful to make ex cathedra pronouncements about what they would decide uh, and what China would be. My job beyond uh, with Gene doing the integration and introductions and synthesis aspects of the book was to look at the sources and the shapers of China's foreign policy. That um, as the decisions are being made in all of these other areas, what were the implications of A, the existence of the challenges and B, the decisions that uh, were made to deal with them for China's international aspirations, the way it is viewed in the world, and the way it's going to interact with the world. In part, it was a chapter, it was a reaction to rebuttal to the uh, China is going to dominate, take over the world, transform the system. So my chapter, like others in the book, issues essentialist kind of predictions of China. China is going to be a certain way because it is an authoritarian party state dominated by the Communist Party. And imputing to that state, that system, aspirations without much regard to its capability to fulfill those aspirations. So I ask what drives and shapes China's foreign policy. And my starting point was to go back to the beginning of reform and opening in the late 70s. Uh, it's not an accident that reform and opening are the two hands that clapped to produce the change in China. Without domestic reform, there could not be engagement uh, leading to the kind of economic growth there was. Without the economic international engagement, could not sustain, uh, could not even launch the domestic economic uh, transformation. So it treats foreign policy as an integral component of and a principal facilitator of the achievement of national objectives. And the highest national objective in the late 70s, today, and my projection uh, in these chapters into the future, is going to be sustained economic growth facilitated by steady development and modernization. The decision to follow the export-led model of development brought with it immediate prerequisites for foreign policy. The key to that strategy was access to the most developed countries in the world that had the capital, the technology, the training capacity, the markets to facilitate export-led growth. All of those countries in the late 70s were close allies of the United States, Western Europe, Japan, uh, Canada, uh, so North America, Europe, and Japan. The key 
the access to that group was the United States. So maintaining, first improving relations with the United States, and then maintaining basically good relations with the U.S. became a requisite for continued and effective participation with all of the developing countries in the so-called free world. Um, and that the, this engagement would enmesh China in the liberal rules-based international order, because that's how uh, these countries interacted with one another. It worked very well for all of those countries. China sought a dispensation, some kind of special special rules for China, and nobody was willing to do that. Uh, that the system was working well. Nobody was willing to put it at risk, put their own uh, continued success at risk by tinkering with it for China. So it became a, you want to play in this uh, sandbox, you got to play by the rules of the sandbox. That the argument in the chapter is that as growth slows, which only slowed dramatically in the last decade from double digits down to uh, officially, but probably exaggeratedly, 6% uh, last year, it'll be much lower than that. And by almost universal projections, other than from China, it, it goes to 2 to 4% in just a couple of years. Uh, that means that China is going to have fewer resources to meet rising expectations and demands from a populace that now knows a lot more about the outside world and other parts of China than it did four decades ago or one decade ago. Uh, so it's not the fantasy world of the United States depicted in movies. It's the um, iMovie sent on a cell phone from a cousin who's working now in Shanghai. Um, and the, why can't I have this? So my, the aspirations are different. The demographics are different. That 65 or 70% of the population has known nothing except steady growth, rising uh, aspirations and expectations. Everything in their life experience tells them it's reasonable to want a good job, a higher paying job, less manual labor, you know, better elder care for their parents and grandparents, better health care for everybody, um, better educational opportunities. And that same 65, 70% because of two generations of one child per family. Uh, really expect and need assistance from the government or some social safety net. Otherwise, every 25-year-old couple can look forward to supporting four parents and eight grandparents. Uh, therefore, they really need health care, elder care, high-paying jobs, affordable housing. Otherwise, they can't, and they see it, uh, and they are pressing for it. That, in other chapters in the book, that, that comes through very clearly. I take that as a starting point for even if the leadership became even more uncomfortable about the constraints of engagement with the international system, uh, with the U.S.-led rules-based order, the U.S. leadership, um, with the values espoused by the most successful countries in that order, exit is not an option. But the cost of exiting is now prohibitively high. Uh, one of the aspects of the engagement policy going back four decades, if the Chinese envisioned a uh, temporary get in, get rich, get out, uh, jumpstart China's economy, uh, maintain 
a great deal of control, uh, self-determination for themselves of what they could do and that they would be able to, as they became more modern, they could become less constrained. The Americans in essence said, good luck, you're welcome to try. Uh, but your success is gonna depend on your continued participation in the system. This is in for a penny, in for a pound. Uh, if you get out, your rapid growth, your development, your ability to meet expectations stops or decreases. Um, the argument in the chapter is not that forces China to be uh, make concessions to the United States and to the other developing world. But what it says is self-interest and the ability to uh, honor and implement decisions made on a host of other high priority, indeed higher priority domestic developments with high political salience that are critical to the legitimacy and therefore the longevity of the regime require basic continuity of the foreign policy China has followed for the last 40 years. It basically plays by the rules. Indeed, it increasingly plays by the rules. It's increasingly um, rec increasingly recognizes its stake in the international order because it, as it recognizes its stake, it wants a voice in this order. It doesn't want to overthrow it. It doesn't want radical transformation. It wants a voice. And of course, it should have a voice um, uh, in saying it. And the pattern has been one of joining international control regimes, participating in international multinational organization, contributing to the efficacy of the rules-based system. There are exceptions, uh, but the exceptions are exactly that. Uh, disregard of the Hague Tribunal decision on the South China Sea, at least nominal rejection of it, that empirically they're actually implementing most of the decisions that were made. But it argues for continuity, central continuity, along their trajectory, not stasis, it's moving along the same trajectory of engagement with the international system as a whole, increasingly constrained, not just by the developed world, uh, the U.S. and its allies, but now that the liberal order is the only game in town, uh, and dozens of other countries are trying to take advantage of that system and its opportunities as China did to follow the Chinese path of development have begun to compete with China for places in global production and supply chains that now have uh, lower cost labor um, that makes it incumbent upon China to stay in the game. Uh, once they had a monopoly as a developing country in this system, they no longer have that monopoly. So they have to try harder uh, in order to stay in. So it's an argument for you know, basic continuity. The China that you saw yesterday is the China you will probably see tomorrow. Uh, and the implication of that, uh, among other things, is policy ought to accept and recognize that and not overreact to imagine worst case predictions of what China might become. Why do people think China is a major, if not a superpower? It's economics. It's the size of its economy. It has you know, a, a huge GDP, uh, a huge second largest economy in the world. It's the largest trading nation. It is the largest export def destination for most countries in the world. But it's not the end destination for most products. It's a pass-through. It comes from all over Southeast Asia or Central Asia, South Asia, and the parts come from there, where they come from the developed world and get assembled in China. 
And then they go to North America, Japan, and Europe. The end destinations have not changed very much. Um, and so much of the image of China derives from the artifact of our trading system that we put a made in China stamp uh, on things when they get put into the box. Um, and as that low skill activity moves somewhere else, somebody else is going to get credit for being a major trading company and China is no longer going up, China is going down for reasons that have very little significance beyond companies pursuing comparative advantage uh, for their products in a particular set of circumstances of tax rates and utility rates and land costs uh, and shipping and the price of fuel for shipping, all of these things that enter into it that have got very little to do with politics. So the, the inverse of a lot of the factors that made China look bigger than it is, more important than it is, are going to work to its disadvantage. Uh, it seems to me, inevitably, the pandemic will be a minor stream contributing to this larger river of developments that I, I think constitute one of these uh, inevitable megatrends that you can manage, but you can't avoid. I do not judge that China, and this is going beyond the chapter, uh, these last comments, but the, I don't think China is eager to displace the United States. I've heard enough times from enough senior Chinese uh, over the years that uh, even if they wanted to, they're not ready uh, for lots of reasons. Um, one of which is, A proposal coming from China for change in the international system is highly likely to be dead on arrival because they made it. Uh, and I don't think that's a crazy idea with much of uh, certainly East Asia. Uh, that, as one put it, Americans have a thick skin. You have proposals, you have policies, you have a position on everything. Uh, you make lots of proposals and many of them are shot down. It doesn't bother you. Uh, you pick yourself up and you have another proposal. We can't do that. If our leaders were to make a proposal that is laughed out of the room, they can't survive politically. Our perception of our role and standing in the international system is still pretty fragile. Uh, given the importance of nationalism as a pillar of legitimacy, if we come out of the box with ideas and are unsuccessful, the costs to us are perceived to be very hard. The costs to you are very low. And you've got more room to propose novel ideas uh, because of the weight you play in the international system, because of the history of U.S. leadership, that we need you to lead the way to transforming the international system into something more sustainable. The requirement for them and for us is to figure out how to do it. And the tragedy of the last three years is that we have surrendered uh, much of the leadership role and a great deal of the confidence that others have in the wisdom of the United States, even if it is hedged in the uh, Churchillian characterization that the Americans can always be counted on to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. Uh, that we will eventually get to the right thing. Unfortunately, that no longer exists. That's a, at best a wasting asset that would have to be restored pretty quickly. The alternative to U.S. leadership for the system 
isn't China. It's nobody. It's nobody. 